Welcome everyone to week two of the Build Math Minds book study for math task for the Thinking Classroom grades K through five. In this video, we're gonna go through chapters three, four, and five, and I'll highlight some key points for you to keep in mind. But before we get started, don't forget that we have a Q&A session coming up this week that we would love for you to participate in. Let's start off with chapter three, which is how to build and utilize student autonomy. This chapter describes a new way to develop student autonomy. When we are the only source of help for students, we're actually stunting their development of their own autonomy and developing that. We don't want to gatekeep knowledge. If you see students get stuck, which they will, First, see if there's a group that you can direct them to for help. Or if a group is done with a task, let's direct them to a group where they can get the next task from. Now, some ways in which we currently prevent students from being autonomous, from being present, is when we do things like set up a timer or show them an agenda of what they'll be doing. Um, or tell them they have to complete the same amount of work, or even tell them they'll have to present their solution to the whole class at the end. When we do things like that, it can prevent students from being present in the moment with the task. As you see in this picture, you will see that there are several whiteboards set up. This is an example of what a building thinking classroom setup would look like. The way that the tasks are set up is really important. Now within the whiteboards that you see here, when you set up a task, there will be something called a banner, which is the top six to eight inches of these whiteboards. And that's where the task is written. The book will go into this in much more details and give you examples. But just for you to keep in mind, if one or two groups are far ahead than the others, give them the next task in the sequence. Or if there are one or two groups that are falling behind, be there as soon as they are finished with the task to direct them on to the next one. We basically need every student and every group of students in the classroom to be the knowledge keepers in the room. And that's how we build student autonomy. So the way that you set up these tasks on these banners is really important. Again, the chapter digs into how to set this up in more depth. So please make sure you check that out. Let's move on to chapter four, which is all about how to use hints and extensions to maintain flow. So when we think about the cognitive process, it's invisible to the observer, right? The cognitive process really manifests in physical actions. If your students are thinking, they're engaged. And if they're engaged, they're thinking. We're gonna talk about what the authors describe as flow in just a second, but one thing to take out of this chapter is how to notice whenever a student is having an optimal experience. Ways you'll see that is that they lose track of time. Basically, like more time has passed and the student even realizes. Um, another way is when a student is undistractable, right, and unaware of things in their environment because they're caught up in the flow, in the task, they're engaged. Also, they become less self-conscious, they stop worrying about their own failure, and they just begin doing the activity for the sake of doing it and not for the sake of getting it done. So engagement becomes an end into itself rather than a means to the end. So this is when the students are in flow. And what the authors mean by this is flow is a state of engagement that's accompanied by enjoyment as well, right? As well as positive self-efficacy and a sense of accomplishment. When it comes to boredom and frustration, both of those things lead to disengagement. So there has to be a balance within this system. And there has to be a balance between ability and challenge. This is basically where flow happens. We all know there isn't a lot of thinking when students are bored and frustrated. So we want them thinking and engaged. Now, the work for you as a teacher is to keep students in that state of flow by increasing the challenge as their ability grows. So timing in all of this matters. If we increase the challenge before the ability has even developed, rather than keep students in flow, we're gonna push them into frustration and we, won't, we don't want that. So there are a couple strategies that the chapter gives us to get this timing right. Aside from how in depth the chapter goes into the timing, they do give two really key pieces of information for you to dig into. One is called thin slicing a task, right? So it's basically a series of tasks with 
incremental increases in challenge. And that's really helpful to students. And the second part is hints and the types of hints that you're giving students. There are hints that decrease challenge and there are hints that increase ability. Through a combination of these hints and extensions, you'll be able to maintain flow and engagement in the classroom. Okay, so now let's dig into chapter five, which is all about how to consolidate the task. There are three kinds of consolidations that the book talks about. One is conversation, the second is that the teacher scribes, and the third is guided gallery walks. Let's break down conversation. Conversation is really useful when talking about big ideas and general strategies that came out of student activity. Now with teacher scribes, that's best when more details are needed or required. These are great for convergent tasks, which convergent tasks are basically tasks where every group thinks about it in more or less the same way. The discussion in this showcases the thinking. With both of these, with conversation and teacher scribes, please ensure that this is not a lecture. We are not lecturing here. There are discussions where you as a teacher are asking very focused questions. It's just that with one of them, you as a teacher writes it down and with the other one it's just more of a conversation and you don't write it down. Now as far as guided gallery walks, it pretty much has the same intended purposes as a teacher scribe where more details are needed, but instead of coming uh, it coming from the teacher, it's coming from the student and their existing work. These are great for divergent tasks and those tasks are basically um, tasks that produce a lot of different thinking to solve a problem. Now, the chapter goes in depth on how to consolidate some of these tasks. The teacher scribes relies on two ways of consolidating, which is noticing and naming variations. And for consolidating a guided gallery walk, you go through the process of selecting, seeding, and sequencing. So please be sure to read those sections of this chapter thoroughly because it will help you with the implementation of your lessons. So why do we want to consolidate task in the first place? Why do we want to consolidate this? Why should we do it? We really want students to go from the simplest way of thinking to the most complex or from the most concrete way of thinking to the most abstract. And the authors call that consolidation from the bottom. Okay, everyone, those were some key points to chapters three, four, and five from our book study. My name is Rosalba Serrano, the founder of Zen Math, as well as a Build Math Minds PD facilitator. And we hope to see you next week where we'll cover chapters six, seven, and eight. Have a great day, everyone.